So this is a session on biology as a data science and its impact on protein evolution. So we'll have speakers who do both um, bioinformatics theory, wet biochemistry, molecular biology, and both. So we'll begin with uh, Madan Abu from the LMB in Cambridge, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, uh, Joel, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here. And uh, what I'd like to do is to thank uh, Venki, Richard, Joel, Nathan, and the organizing committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to present some of our work today. Uh, and what I'd like to do in the next 35 minutes or so is to talk to you about how we use uh, data science approaches to understand various biological systems. Uh, technological advancements such as high throughput sequencing, proteomics, and electron microscopy, thanks to Richard, um, have all allowed us to generate huge amount of information describing both biological processes and biological entities at many different scales and resolution. Now, this presents us with new opportunities to use computational methods in order to be able to gain fundamental insights and discover new principles by which living systems work. And according to the current estimates of the European Bioinformatics Institute, we have more than 120 petabytes of publicly available information. Now, given the sea of data, what drives us as a group scientifically is to find out how we could integrate and use all this information to derive new knowledge from these large volumes of data. So my group is interested in understanding data-driven approaches uh, to address biological systems with a particular emphasis on proteins at three distinct levels of complexity. So at the molecular level, we aim to discover novel regulatory features of important signaling and regulatory molecules, such as GPCRs, nuclear receptors, and so on. At the systems level, we are interested in understanding how the different regulatory processes interact with each other to influence cellular homeostasis, uh, and how breakdown of this give rise to disease outcome. And at the genome level, uh, we try to understand uh, the interplay between genome evolution and the requirement to achieve all these different regulatory constraints. Now, to this end, we develop interdisciplinary approaches that tries to integrate, mine, and analyze very different types of data, ranging from sequence, structure, expression, and network, in order to be able to address some of these questions. All right, so in the last century, we have witnessed uh, multiple revolutions in our understanding of biological systems, from the elicitation of the central dogma uh, to uh, obtaining complete genome sequences of multiple organisms and also elicitating structures of uh, many different proteins and protein complexes from a variety of sequences. And through these advances, we now also appreciate that if DNA is the blueprint of life, proteins are really the building blocks. Now, if you ask how function is achieved through a sequence of amino acids, the classical paradigm is that the sequence of amino acids adopts a defined three-dimensional structure. Of course, dynamics is a very important part of function, and this gives rise to uh, uh, different functions for the protein. Now, in the last 15 years or so, and as we have heard in several talks yesterday too, the structure function paradigm is now expanded to include what's called the disorder function paradigm where a sequence of amino acid can adopt multiple conformational states, and each one of these different conformational states can be important for achieving different functions. So a key question that we also address in my group is to ask how is function achieved by disordered regions? So this is going to be the outline of my presentation today. I'll have two halves to my talk. In the first part, I'll present some of our work on disordered proteins, especially highlighting their role in biology and disease. Uh, and also, I'll discuss a little bit of ongoing work in terms of how we use high throughput approaches to understand what are the functional regions in unstructured regions. And in the second part, I'll be speaking about G-protein coupled receptors, providing a brief introduction into uh, the kind of mechanistic insights one could obtain by uh, comparing structures. And then by integrating genome sequence data, uh, we try to get an understanding of the diversity in polymorphisms that we see in the human population and the implications of these. All right, so what are intrinsically disordered regions? So IDRs are polypeptide segments that lack a defined three-dimensional structure, a unique three-dimensional structure, either entirely or in parts, and it's believed that they sample a variety of different conformations that are in dynamic equilibrium between each other under different physiological conditions. So why is it important to study IDRs? I mean, there are several reasons. The three main reasons that uh, I personally feel uh, is interesting is that they are prevalent and perform critical functions. The using methods that Joel and Keith developed several years ago, it was shown that over 40% of any eukaryotic proteome have large regions that are intrinsically unstructured. Uh, 
And these are not just passive linkers, because it is very clear that several of these segments perform critical functions in transcription or in determining the half-life of proteins, as well as uh, in forming higher-order assemblies. The second reason why uh, it's important to study IDRs, as we heard from Sheena's talk yesterday, many of these IDRs are also implicated in diverse diseases, ranging from cancer and neurodegeneration. And more than 25% of known disease mutations actually occur within intrinsically disordered regions, several of which we don't have a full mechanistic understanding of why they cause disease. And finally, IDRs, specifically short peptides within IDRs, like what we heard in Ehud's talk yesterday, have very unusual material properties that have also been exploited by cells in many different contexts. And this is another interesting uh, reason why it's, it's useful to study IDRs. In fact, people have identified specific segments from naturally occurring sequences that can be used for controlled drug release and related uh, biotechnology applications. So the key point that I wanted to highlight is that there is an enormous opportunity to understand new biology by studying some aspects of intrinsically disordered regions for the future. So if they don't adopt defined structures, so how exactly do ideas contribute to function? So there are two main mechanisms by which they contribute to function, beyond several others that I won't be discussing today. So one is that they expose short linear peptide motifs. So these are uh, three to seven amino acid stretches that occur within disordered segments that can mediate domain peptide interactions. And Aura here in the audience has done some very interesting work on trying to look at domain peptide interactions that are exploited in many different signaling contexts. The other mechanisms by which disordered region contribute to function is by acting as a substrate for post-translation modifications. We all know about the histone tails, but the same protein can exist in different modified states. Each one of these modified states can be exploited for completely diverse functions, ranging from transcription to replication or repair. So IDRs uh, act as hubs, because within a short segment of about 50 amino acids, you could have multiple motifs or multiple post-translation modification sites. And hence, these proteins emerge as hubs in protein interaction networks and in important cellular decision-making processes. But dynamics is an important component of this uh, phenomenon. So in one of our earlier studies, we actually analyzed transcriptomes from multiple human tissues and showed that alternative splicing tends to affect short segments that encode linear peptide motifs. And in this manner, they can rewire protein-protein interactions in a tissue-specific manner. So the same protein can mediate slightly different interactions in different tissues. So here's an example of the phosphatidylinositol phosphate phi kinase gene. The isoform that is expressed in the brain includes a short unstructured segment. Both of these contain the structured domains which perform uh, the biochemical activity, but the real difference comes from these short segments that then expose an AP2 binding motif, which then allows interaction with the AP2 protein, and thus in the brain, this protein is endocytosed more effectively, whereas in the lymph node, they are present here for uh, large periods of time. So nature can exploit uh, unstructured regions to rewire protein interactions by using different regulatory mechanisms like alternative splicing. So here's another example where uh, Paxin2 uh, is a protein where the isoform that is expressed in the breast tissue encodes an unstructured region that has multiple <coughs> phosphorylation sites for protein kinase A. However, the isoform that is expressed in the brain does not include this segment. And what this essentially means is that even though the same kinase is expressed in two different tissues, it can recruit this protein as a substrate in one tissue, but not in the other. So you could still reuse uh, important signaling kinases to rewire phosphorylation networks in a tissue-specific manner by either specifically including or excluding short unstructured regions that contain these phosphorylation motifs. Now, in another study, uh, we looked at many of the naturally occurring gene fusions in many different types of cancer. So I'd like to just walk you through one example involving the FLE1 proto-oncogene and the Ewing sarcoma oncogene. So the gene fusion ends up recruiting a DNA-binding domain, but then it loses a disordered region that has a ubiquitination site. 
It includes an unstructured region that has a linear motif that can interact with the trans transcriptional machinery, but then again loses these uh, disordered regions that have ubiquitination sites. So in a sense, uh, the gene fusion results in the creation of a DNA binding domain that has a disordered region with a transactivation domain, and hence you have a very strong transcription factor that cannot be regulated by naturally occurring uh, processes uh, such as ubiquitination that allows for the degradation of these proteins. So the gain of functional motifs and loss of critical regulatory motifs involved in gene fusion essentially means that these cancer gene fusion products can rewire network and alter these networks in a permanent manner. And more importantly, they could also escape cellular regulation because they lose these ubiquitination sites but still gain these important uh, functional motifs that can drive certain biological processes uh, in an uncontrolled manner. So another important attribute that I'd like to highlight about these uh, linear motifs and post-translation modification sites is that because many of the functional elements involve three to seven amino acids or a single amino acid for a post-translation modification site, this essentially means that a small number of mutations can result in the emergence or loss of these linear motifs. And this essentially means that you can gain or lose interactions very, very quickly through a small number of mutations. Now, this property is really interesting and important, particularly in the context of viral and tumor genome evolution, where a small number of mutations in key disordered regions can actually result in uh, very different outcomes. So in one of our other studies, uh, we studied viral genomes and systematically analyzed uh, how often uh, viruses exploit host-like peptide motifs to mediate interactions with host proteins to hijack host cellular machinery in order to uh, gain entry or cause virulence. And we found that molecular mimicry in viral proteins is one of the common mechanisms that appears to uh, have been exploited by viral genomes for successful interaction with uh, multiple different host proteins. All right, so while uh, um, several studies have shown that there are some general principles that we could gain by studying disordered regions. Uh, one aspect that we felt was currently missing in the community, uh, which we thought will have an impact in the field, is to develop a targeted and a high throughput approach that allows us to discover which parts of these disordered regions are functional in a cellular context, yeah? and understand how exactly they contribute to function. So given the prevalence of these disordered regions in genomes, so we got interested in the following two questions. How can we identify which regions within these disordered uh, segments are actually functional? And what are the rules that governs functionality? And this led us to the motivation to develop a targeted and a high throughput approach to discover what are these functional segments. So uh, through Charles Ravarani, Pavitra Chawali, and Jahan Lee in the group, uh, we basically develop what's called IDR screen. So IDR screen is uh, an approach where next generation sequencing technology meets what I call unstructured biology. So first, an appropriate selection system for the protein function of interest is identified and validated. Then a library of variants are created. This could have a heavy computational component where it could be a design library or it could be a random library from a proteome of interest. And then the library is introduced into the selection system. And after introducing it to the selection system, we perform next-gen sequencing before and after selection. So you know which sequences have the function of interest. And finally, we use machine learning to analyze sequences that are what I call true positives, which have the function of interest, and sequences that don't have the function of interest, which is true negative. And then this allows us to identify patterns and rules in those sequences, which can then go in an iterative manner uh, to validate or test whether the patterns that you have learned is actually right or wrong. So in this manner, idea screen basically permits a quantification of protein function of individual members in a library of sequences uh, in a small number of experiments. So I'm just going to walk you through one specific application of IDR screen, where we try to understand what are the segments within disordered regions of transcription factors that can function as transactivation domains. So typically, a transcription factor has two components, a structured domain that recognizes DNA in a sequence-specific manner, and it has a large unstructured region, and somewhere in that unstructured region <coughs> are a few residues that mediate interaction with various components of the transcriptional machinery, and, and it, uh, it brings the transcriptional machinery to the site in order to initiate transcription. Now, the specific assay that we uh, created uh, involved the use of the yeast 
heat shock transcription factor, HSF1. So that's the full length transcript, which has the DNA binding domain and an unstructured segment with the transactivation domain that can mediate interaction with the transcriptional machinery. So under 30 degrees, uh, you see survival. At 37 degrees, they're not happy, but still survive because they could initiate an efficient transactivation response. However, when you knock off or remove uh, or create a truncated version of this protein, they're still okay at 30 degrees, but they don't survive at 37 degrees. So this becomes the survival assay that we use in the screen. So then we create uh, a library of random uh, sequences, and then we can actually create chimeric versions of these proteins through creation of a plasmid library. And then we could take this uh, library of sequences into yeast and ask who is able to confer survival. And the inference is those sequences that can confer survival have something to do with transactivation function. So it is mechanism agnostic, but it is uh, uh, indicative of a certain phenotype. So these are some of the results that we could obtain by using a random library of sequences. For instance, when we started with a, a random sequence of about 70,000 different uh, combinations of amino acids, each one of these lines represents one such sequence before selection at 30 degrees. And after selection, you could see that there are some individual sequences in the library that have and count for fitness, and they get represented and selected for uh, uh, in a much higher level, again, indicating that these are some of the trans strong transactivation domains, and there are a few other sequences that do have transactivation activity. Now, we could also use this approach to study the effect of polymorphisms or even discover which regions within uh, large transactivation segments are actually performing the function of interest. So we could use uh, public databases uh, to monitor single nucleotide polymorphisms in disordered regions that occur in the human genome, as well as mutations that are seen in cancer genomes to ask whether these mutations in these disordered segments are actually functional or whether they are likely to lead to phenotypic consequences or not. And through this library, uh, we were able to identify which mutations actually are likely to have a transactivation activity defect and which ones are likely to be neutral. So in this manner, idea screen can also be used to infer the impact of naturally occurring mutations in unstructured regions uh, in the human population. Now, once we have all these results, we could then go back and analyze what are all the different properties that are enriched in uh, naturally occurring transactivation domains compared to the random sequences that we looked at. And from those rules, we could also design very simple sequences that could have transactivation activity. Uh, and you could tune the strength of the transacti uh, transactivation activity by playing with some of these parameters. So in summary, uh, um, using idea screen, uh, we could identify the different transactivation domains from random libraries of sequences and also learn what are the properties that confer functionality. And we could also design from these sequences de novo, uh, um, excuse me, from these uh, uh, rules, de novo sequences that could function as transactivation domains. It could also be used to infer uh, the functional uh, effects of polymorphisms and disease mutations. And one could also use the models to scan genomes to identify what are the likely TADs in uh, other naturally occurring proteins and also infer mutational effects. Now, in terms of ongoing work, uh, what we're trying to do is to discover some of the molecular mimicry events that I mentioned early on in my talk that occur in viral genomes. So we've been trying to discover what are the degrons in the Zika viral genome. And the initial screen identified a uh, few segments within the Zika proteome that can have uh, uh, protein half-life modulating activity. And we've also been interested in identifying peptides that could be associated with uh, phase-separating droplets uh, within the cellular context. I'm happy to talk about them if anyone's interested after the presentation. So in summary, what I'd like to highlight is that Idea Screen integrates uh, uh, many different types of uh, approaches. And because the steps of Idea Screen are modular and scalable, uh, it can be adapted to study a broad range of functions. You could test new libraries of sequences and also explore different genetic background and various experimental conditions. And more importantly, if a selection system can be designed, then the approach can be readily extended to uh, other organisms. All right, so I'd just like to take a, a little step back at this part of the talk uh, to provide a broader perspective of where and how disordered regions can fit into the big picture of how cellular complexity evolves in nature. Now, if you ask about the different mechanisms for the evolution of organismal diversity and complexity, uh, people have thought about this problem for a long time. And there are many solutions to this. 
the first solution that was proposed in as early as 1970 is that you create new genes through gene duplication, and this is one mechanism by which you can diversify functions of proteins. Soon after, uh, King and Wilson proposed that you could control the expression of existing genes during development, and this could also give rise to diversity in uh, phenotypes and complexity. And now in the era of systems biology, it is also clear that you could use the same gene but rewire them in different functional contexts and hence increase the uh, phenotypic complexity, like in the case of uh, um, using the same protein but in different networks in different contexts in different tissues. So you could either create or you could control or connect existing components in different ways. And this can explain why, uh, in terms of uh, the genome complexity, the number of proteins is not the only determinant of complexity, but where these proteins are made and how exactly they're connected in the different tissues in different contexts can contribute to diversity and physiological complexity. So I mentioned early on that disordered regions, excuse me, for some reason, this is not coming up. Anyway, so I mentioned early on that disordered regions have a very interesting property, which is that through a small number of mutations, they can actually rewire protein-protein interaction. So if you ask how exactly protein disorder can contribute or enable phenotypic complexity, I'd just like to highlight that in the genotype to phenotype space, interaction of biological molecules is an important determinant of the emergence of various phenotypes. So unlike structured domains, a small number of mutations within disordered region has a very high potential to make or break protein-protein interactions. And hence, in this manner, disordered regions can very rapidly generate diversity and complexity through network re rewiring through a small number of mutations. Of course, this has implications for diseases in the short uh, time scale. It also has implications for evolvability in a much larger time scale. So what I'd like to highlight is that Protein disorder uh, is not only a, uh, a linker, but it is actually a powerful medium that can fuel the evolution of organismal complexity and diversity through the creation of new and novel networks of interactions. So this is not to say that disorder is more important or uh, not, and structured domains are less important, but what I'd like to highlight is that they both have complementary aspects of function that evolution exploits. So it's a bit like a yin and yang. So structured domains have conserved function, so they are actually reused in multiple different organisms, but the disordered regions are rapidly evolvable. It allows creation of new interaction, and hence, if a protein has both a structured domain and a disordered region, you could reuse the same biochemical function in many different activity and regulate them very, very differently, and this can create uh, enormous uh, uh, possibilities in a combinatorial manner for evolution to create uh, new protein functions. So it's really the synergy between the disordered regions and structured protein domains that increases the functional versatility of proteins that occur in genomes. And not surprisingly, if you look at completely sequenced genomes of any organism, there are very few proteins that are purely unstructured, very few proteins that are purely structured. A majority of them have a combination of both, and this gives them the possibility to be regulated in many different ways. All right, so in the remaining half of my talk, what I'd like to do is to switch gears and present some of our ongoing work on G-protein coupled receptors. So what are GPCRs? I mean, we heard uh, and Carol already discussed and presented some spectacular data on GPCRs yesterday. But I'd like to provide a very brief introduction. So GPCRs, or G-protein coupled receptors, are the largest family of membrane proteins in the human genome. So they have a seven transmembrane helix architecture, as shown in this uh, structure that was solved by my colleague Chris Tate at the LMB. And there are more than 800 different GPCRs that are encoded by the human genome. Each one of these receptors participate in diverse physiological processes, ranging from uh, sensory responses, such as vision, taste, uh, as well as uh, smell, to those regulating behavior, the immune system, and the cardiac system. Now, in this manner, GPCRs govern virtually every aspect of uh, human physiology. Now, given their role in modulating human physiology, it is also not surprising that they can actually act as very attractive drug targets. So currently, more than one-third of all FDA-approved drugs target uh, one of these uh, different members. Now, over 300 different agents in various stages of clinical trials uh, are also targeting an additional 60 different GPCRs uh, to modulate disease phenotypes, such as obesity, diabetes, asthma, and other uh, disorders. Now, in the last few years, there have been a, a, an enormous progress in GPCR structure determination. For instance, we have more than 350 uh, different structures of over 50 different GPCRs. This slide needs to be uh, updated. 
And we also have uh, uh, information about uh, which receptors coupled to what G proteins. Uh, and thanks to, again, electron microscopy, complexes of receptors with arrestin as well as other G proteins are now being uh, routinely determined in, the, uh, in various labs across the world. So when you have two structures, it is fairly easy to compare them and identify what are the common uh, uh, features and what are the features that are likely to be different. But then when you have more than 250 structures, it becomes very difficult to ask whether there are even any common governing principles or whether each one of these structures are extremely unique. So in our group, what we do is to use a network approach where we represent every structure as a network of non-covalent contacts between topologically equivalent amino acids in this protein family. And then we ask whether there are common features of these networks or not. Now, through the work of uh, a very talented PhD student, AJ Venkatakrishnan, we systematically studied uh, many different structures, uh, high resolution structures of GPCRs that were available at the time uh, to identify what is called as a ligand binding cradle. So these are topologically equivalent residues in completely unrelated GPCRs that almost always make contacts with ligands. These positions are spatially equivalent, but in terms of chemical identity, they have enormous diversity, and that gives them the opportunity to recognize many different chemically diverse ligands. And then by systematically studying the active state of the receptor and the inactive state of the receptor, uh, we were also able to identify common rewiring of specific residues that have been linked with uh, uh, receptor activation. And by also integrating uh, data on sequences uh, of orthologs from uh, various different organisms that are available from completely sequenced genomes, we were also able to infer what are the selectivity signatures that act as a barcode on the G protein that are recognized by the different GPCRs. And finally, through the structure-based approach that I described early on, we were also able to compare structures of G proteins in the inactive state and in the active state to infer the allosteric mechanism by which Y receptor binding to the G protein results in the release of the nucleotide on the G protein side. So through a series of uh, computational approaches, uh, we were able to gain some insights into properties of ligand binding. Uh, mechanism of receptor activation, and how exactly uh, receptors recognize specific uh, amino acids on the G protein, uh, essentially leading to G protein activation and, and GDP release. Now, for those interested in applying uh, network approaches to studying uh, protein structures, we also created what is called as the Protein Contact Atlas, uh, which is a representation of all the non-covalent contacts uh, of protein structures, uh, uh, which anyone might be interested in using, can explore uh, in terms of what are the contacts that are likely to be important and what are the contacts that rewire uh, in different uh, physiological states. Now, uh, having obtained some mechanistic insights into this large family of GPCRs, we also became interested in applying this knowledge to a problem in human health, and therefore we focused on uh, pharmacogenomics. And what we noticed was that despite the importance of GPCRs in human physiology as a major drug target, uh, one thing caught our attention, which is that there's no variant information that is currently included in the labeling uh, information of drugs. Now, is this because GPCRs are not variable in the human population, or is this because we have not looked into this issue carefully, uh, was not known, and this got us interested into this problem? So we specifically addressed the following three questions. So given that receptors are attractive drug targets, how variable are these GPCR drug targets in the human population? Do individuals with variant receptors respond differently to drugs? And what is the estimated economic burden that is associated with variation in GPCR drug targets in public health systems like the NHS? So in this study, what we did was to integrate multiple large-scale data sets of the various FDA-approved drugs and their known targets with data on receptors in complex with diverse ligands and effector molecules. We had information about polymorphisms from over 60,000 individuals in the human population. Excuse me. We also had data on functional effects that many labs have performed over the many years uh, through literature. And we also had information about drug sales data from the UK National Health Services to address some of these questions. So by analyzing the exome sequence from the 60,000 individuals, we showed that several of the receptors that are highly variable uh, in the human populations, uh, 
And more importantly, by integrating this information with the FDA-approved drugs, we could find that several of the highly uh, targeted receptors are also highly polymorphic uh, in the human population. Now, this is just a slide that uh, highlights some of the examples of polymorphisms that are commonly occurring in the human population uh, mapped to receptor uh, drug complexes. So there are several polymorphisms that act right in the ligand binding pocket. So that's the beta-1 adrenergic receptor in complex with dobutamine or 5-hydroxytryptamine receptor in complex with ergotamine. So these positions are uh, highly polymorphic in the human population. Now, there are also several instances where polymorphisms occur within unstructured regions that are post-translationally modified, uh, which are important for either uh, receptor expression or for receptor internalization. So this could affect the amounts of receptor that are present on the membrane. And we also find polymorphisms around the effector binding molecules that could either tune the strength of interaction or modulate the selectivity of uh, receptor effector interaction. So what we essentially find is that there are several individuals uh, who carry such variant receptors, and this suggested that uh, these individuals might likely respond differently to drugs, either due to ineffective binding or due to altered receptor expression or altered binding to uh, effector molecules. Now, this is the compendium of all available structures in complex with the various FDA-approved drugs, and the red positions are the ones that are highly polymorphic in the human population. Uh, I'd like to just uh, highlight one specific example, which includes the CCR5 chemokine receptor, which is the target for Maraviroc. And seven out of the eight positions that contact directly this FDA-approved drug are highly polymorphic in the human population, suggesting that these individuals are less likely to be uh, responding to Maraviroc treatment. Now, we also went on uh, and collaborated with Kirill Martemino and Ikuo Masuho to test some of the effects of the polymorphisms that we identified through this study. So one of the observations that we made was that the mu opioid receptor, which is the target for many of the uh, analgesics and opioid drugs, was the most polymorphic in the human population. So uh, Kirill and Ikuo developed a bread-based approach that then allowed us to uh, uh, deconvolute the physiological responses to an agonist or a partial agonist or an antagonist. So if someone's got pain, you give them an agonist, such as morphine, for pain relief. Or if someone is addicted to a drug, you give them a partial agonist, which is buprenorphine, with the idea that you take them off the drug. Or if someone has got an opioid overdose, you give them an antagonist, and then you shut down a response. So you can have a full agonist response or a partial agonist response or an antagonist response here. Now, that's the naturally occurring ligand in black, which is uh, uh, endomorphine. Now, we tested some of the variants that occur in the human polymorphisms, shown here in red, green, and blue. And when you look at the endogenous ligand, you don't see a big response except for this red polymorphism, which shows a slightly reduced signaling capacity. However, when you look at morphine response, the red polymorphism shows a much reduced response compared to the blue or the green polymorphism, suggesting that this individual might not respond effectively to uh, an opioid drug. But the more uh, interesting observation comes from when you look at the effect of buprenorphine or naloxone. So rather than having a partial response, in uh, the green polymorphism or the blue polymorphism shows a full agonist response. And what this suggests is if there are individuals who carry this polymorphism on a de-addiction program, they're perhaps not going to respond as effectively as one may want to. But the most serious observation comes from when you look at naloxone, where if someone's got an opioid overdose uh, and then you give them with a, an antagonist, rather than shutting down the response, you have a partial agonist response or a full agonist response, suggesting that they have a gain of function uh, mutation here. So the key point that I wanted to highlight is that these polymorphisms need not only disrupt protein function, but they could also give rise to new gain of function mutations that may not be obvious when uh, looking at their response to the naturally occurring polymorphism. So in the last section of a study, we looked at the potential economic impact of drug target variability. And to address this problem, uh, we used the data that was available through what's called the Open Prescribing Project, which is all the uh, drugs that have been administered through the NHS are publicly available uh, uh, for any kind of study. And we develop an economic model that takes into account the cost of the drug and the frequency of these polymorphisms and the likelihood to occur within functional sites or not. So in, uh, in the UK, just for one year, about uh, two billion pounds are being spent on GPCR-related drugs, and we estimate that about 20% of the cost 
is likely to uh, result in ineffective drug response due to the polymorphisms that may be occurring uh, in the population. I'll be very happy to talk about this uh, later on in my presentation if anyone's interested. All right, so to summarize this part, um, what we have shown is that GPCRs that are targeted by drugs do display extensive genetic variation in the human population, and that variation occurs within functional sites, which might result in a, an altered drug response. And understanding such genetic variation could perhaps reduce global healthcare expenses. Now, again, in the UK, um, the NHS is very interested in applying pharmacogenomics to the clinic. So the UK Pharmacogenomics Consortium, which we are a part of, is trying to assess whether implementing this information in the clinic is likely to really result in uh, uh, an appropriate uh, um, you know, um, change of lifestyle or uh, cost savings to the NHS. And the, the pilot project is going to start from next year. And hopefully, uh, we might have some results to know whether this is worth uh, a direction to go forward or not. So all the information that we have um, obtained through this data integration approach involving uh, structural data as well as uh, polymorphism data are publicly available for anyone who is interested uh, in any particular receptor or a drug through what's called the G-protein coupled receptor database that is maintained by my collaborator, David Glorium. So you have information about the polymorphisms for any given receptor, uh, the effect of uh, whether these polymorphisms are likely to be deleterious, neutral, or uh, inconsequential. Uh, uh, and we also have information about uh, the different drugs that target these receptors and how much they actually cost uh, in terms of uh, uh, the level of prescription that happens within the UK. So these are information which we thought might be broadly relevant or useful for uh, different uh, uh, researchers for various questions. All right, so I'd like to uh, highlight a couple of implications of this study. So the multi-scale data integration approach that we developed here, ranging from taking FDA-approved drugs all the way to NHS sales information, could actually be adapted to study other important drug targets such as ion channels and nuclear receptors. And this is something that uh, we are currently pursuing. So we are looking at nuclear receptors in particular. The information that uh, we have also put together can be used to prioritize drugs for pharmacovigilance investigation by regulatory bodies, which is to see whether some of the drugs that were approved 30 years ago are effectively uh, performing in the market, or is this a time to reassess whether some of these uh, targets should be revisited with new drugs. It could be valuable for post-market follow-up studies. And interestingly, it could also be employed for patient stratification, especially for those entering clinical trials to ask whether individuals have these polymorphisms to uh, substratify these patients as responders or non-responders. Now, beyond these implications, there's another implication which I'm personally uh, very interested and excited about, which is one could go back and look at failed drugs things that went into phase one and phase two, but did not make it into phase three to ask whether some of these drugs could actually be uh, effective for a subpopulation uh, um, uh, who were responders at a certain stage of the, uh, the drug clinical study. All with the hope that we can use several of this information to move from this model where we have one treatment fits all, where you have this enormous diversity in the human population who are treated with the same drug and the same dose. You have those who are responders for those who have no effect and those who have adverse reaction to using genomic data as a guide to ask whether they're going to be able to stratify individuals uh, in, in, in this manner and thus either change the drug or change the mode of operation of uh, which targets should be um, uh, drugged, uh, depending on what the phenotype or physiological effect is. So in terms of future directions, I thought I'll highlight a couple of ongoing studies that are going on in my group. Uh, so we are broadly interested, as I mentioned, in exploiting all these data sets to understand biochemical systems. And currently, there are three major revolutions that are happening. So in the EM field, uh, you have new structures of proteins and protein complexes that are being generated at a very la large and rapid rate. At the molecular scale, uh, single cell transcriptomics data as well as proteomic time-resolved and space-resolved proteomics data are becoming available. And then in terms of the genomic revolution, we have information about genetic data, both in disease mutations as well as in healthy human population. What we are hoping to do is to integrate these studies to understand variation on, in biochemical systems at all these three different levels. So moving from uh, individual proteins to small complexes such as nuclear receptors to massive molecular machines like the ribosome or the proteasome. Uh, 
Uh, and the idea is to understand biochemical variation at three different time scales, at the evolutionary time scale, the genetic time scale, and disease time scale, as well as in terms of the composition, to ask whether there are splice variants that can be incorporated in different complexes, and whether different subunits are expressed in different tissues and space, as well as to resolve their expression using single cell transcriptomic data. So in this context, Maria has already started looking at GTEx data uh, to identify several of the drug targets that are differentially expressed between males and females, as well as the same drug target that are expressed to different levels between individuals who are young and individuals who are old. Now, again, using nuclear receptor as an example, Greg in our group is trying to understand variation at all these three different levels of complexity uh, to understand how much diversity you have in terms of isoforms that are expressed in different tissues. Now, Jonathan Quick is looking at large protein complexes, in this case ribosomes. There are several subunits that have multiple paralogs, and he observed that many of these paralogs are uniquely expressed in different tissues and space, suggesting that you could have minor comp uh, compositional heterogeneities in, in uh, large protein complexes that are expressed in different tissues. All right, so with this, I'd like to uh, kind of like conclude uh, my presentation by having this one closing remark which is that I hope I've tried to highlight we can use uh, large-scale data sets to convert data to knowledge, uh, and then hopefully uh, some of these knowledge uh, can be exploited for health such as in interpretation mutations or to understand disease context or to be able to exploit them for uh, synthetic biology application and biotechnology like I mentioned in the case of the Idea Screen uh, project. So I'd also like to thank the many organizations that have provided funding for various aspects of research. And none of this work would have been possible without the long-term funding from the MRC. And I'd also like to thank the ERC for uh, supporting our research. I tried to highlight uh, several of the group members who were involved in the projects at uh, the various stages of my presentation. And thank you again for the opportunity, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madame, very much. I think this. Um, presentation really shows how, um, how much data science and structural biology is playing a role in health, which is not often seen at this level. So the talk is open for questions. Please, thank you. So this polymorphism in GPCRs, yeah. they must be such that they don't uh, affect the response to the natural layer. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. you know, they're You're deleterious. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. So um, it, it should be possible then to find inhibitors that mimic the natural ligand sufficiently, yes. that, you know, so you, so you can overcome the polymorph That's right, yeah. polymorphism. So That's one question. The other is you alluded to machine learning, and uh, but you didn't say much about it. Yes. Uh, you know about how how it was used to uh, look at these disordered regions, That's right, yes. and you also didn't. Uh, explain why you chose a random forest yes. versus deep neural nets. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for both the questions, Venki. So for the first question, I have to highlight that, you know, I mean, one reason why, uh, I mean, one reason which, one question that does come to anyone's mind is like, why are these polymorphisms not removed from the human population if they're likely to be deleterious? Now, when we look at many of the uh, 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 polymorphisms that happen in these receptors, we do find that they are around the ligand binding pocket, but not at the ligand binding pocket, and that can explain why natural endogenous ligands don't see these mutations. Uh, and many of the individuals are treated with this drug post-reproductive fitness. They've already passed on the genes, especially if you know, many of these drugs are given for age-related uh, uh, phenotypic diversity or to phenotypic diseases. And in those cases, uh, uh, we observe that they can lead to minor heterogeneity in the phenotype of the individual, uh, like in the case of the hormone receptors, but they don't have a drastic effect. But the mutation only becomes very apparent when they treat with synthetic chemicals that are not part of the natural endogenous. So it exactly goes to the point that if it is in the drug binding, in the natural ligand binding pocket, they would not be occurring as frequently. But they are. Uh, so one way to address the question about uh, how to target them is rather than orthosteric ligands, one could also think about allosteric ligands, where you could have sites that are not at the ligand binding pocket that can modulate this activity. So that's one uh, possible strategy for um, uh, dealing with diversity in, in polymorphisms in own drug targets. Now, for the second question about uh, uh, what aspect of machine learning that we used for the disordered regions and how exactly did we uh, implement this, I'd like to just very briefly highlight that 
uh, uh, there are two major schools of machine learning, um, and this is essentially that you have uh, neural networks or those where you have features that you can define using an intuitive manner, and that's exactly where uh, an approach like random forest allows us to give interpretable results where we could tell which feature of the sequence was relevant for uh, the classification. And also the sample size that we have is not very high at the moment. I think Saral will talk in his presentation where if he could scale up the number of different variants to uh, the millions or like you know tens of millions of sequences, then one could uh, come up with new features uh, that can allow us to use uh, neural networks to be able to uh, more precisely make the prediction. But the interpretability is something that uh, uh, one will have to think about. Uh, and here, uh, the scale of the sequences were not very high. So we're dealing with 70,000 sequences or 20,000 different variants that are naturally occurring proteins. Uh, and therefore, we went for the biologically interpretable uh, way to classify sequences. So for every sequence, we could come up with a set of features like uh, amino acid composition, the presence of a motif, chart states, uh, or like, you know, presence of hydrophobic residues or small patterns. And that allowed us to interpret the results. And then we could use these uh, uh, features that were interpretable to design new sequences uh, that we could then test. So these were the two uh, reasons why we chose one type of machine learning approach or the other. Yeah. Bertan? You mentioned the phase separation droplets. I didn't understand what I Yeah, I so, so uh, uh, phase separation is broadly... Uh, a mechanism which uh, involves the formation of higher order assemblies that are uh, uh, like organelles but without the presence of a membrane. So they are very heterogeneous in their composition or in terms of stoichiometry. Uh, I mean, one of the examples that Sheena showed, which is formation of fibrils, is a phase separated uh, deposit, which is an irreversible phase separation that happens. But in biology, there are many reversible phase separations that happen simply because the forces that bring these individual monomers to form these droplets are not that strong. So the monomers can go in and out of these droplets. So classic examples of phase separation involve what's called as the stress granule. So when you stress cells, you can actually start seeing puncta. And uh, um, the question that we wanted to ask is, what drives, what are the molecular forces that drive phase separation? So using a design library of sequences, we could then ask what sequences associate with different phase separated droplets, and then understand what's a chemical environment in that phase separated droplet. Uh, and that's exactly what I was trying to uh, address here. I just ask one question. Sure. In the first part, um, there's no doubt that the unstructured proteins are playing a key role. But for the unstructured proteins, which have large regions that are unstructured, why aren't they degraded? Are they always bound to something else to prevent the degradation? That's a great question. So this goes back to the question that Venki had yesterday for Sharon's talk, which is about uh, uh, if these regions are unstructured, then proteasome eating up these segments are uh, uh, unlikely to be a good mechanism for. Uh, so I think the point that I'd like to highlight here is that uh, protein synthesis is in a flux. So there is synthesis and degradation at all times. Uh, and therefore, in many of these large unstructured regions, when you look at their abundance, I mean, you have shown this in your earlier study, and we have kind of like shown this too, that many of these proteins that have large unstructured regions are present in small abundances. They're not present in very high abundances. And if you inhibit the proteasome, uh, you immediately see their levels going up, suggesting that there is a basal level of degradation that ensures that these proteins are present in, in low levels. And, and uh, Yossi Schall from the Weizmann Institute has also shown that uh, many of these proteins that are unstructured can be part of large multi-subunit complexes, so the proteasome may not have access to some of these unstructured regions in, in the same way as a monomeric subunit uh, uh, can have access to the proteasome. And there's also a very interesting way to regulate the complex abundance in stoichiometry. If there are 10 subunits that come together to form a complex, if one of the subunits is present in excess abundance, then those that have unstructured region can be degraded uh, if they are not part of the functional complex. Uh, and that's another way by which one could look at uh, uh, the functional unit as a complex rather than as a monomer uh, that is unstructured. Yeah. Carol, please. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you, Carol. Um, thinking about the two halves, you had intrinsically disordered and GPCRs. And we know that there are a lot of intrinsically disordered loops yeah. and termini on the GPCRs. But I guess your structural 
database can't take that into that's a, account? That's a great question, uh, Carl. So that's exactly where I'm hoping that in the last section of the talk where we're trying to integrate uh, large-scale data sets, like alternative splicing. So Maria in the group, uh, we have a project that we've just finished where we were looking at the effect of alternative splicing on GPCRs. And that has really shown us some very interesting uh, results, which is that every cell expresses multiple isoforms of the receptor, and the isoform changes come from the loops, which either couple with the G protein or that uh, are phosphorylated and mediate interactions with their restin. So you end up having multiple subpopulations yep. that can bind to the same ligand, but then you have the dominant isoform that kind of like results in one cellular response, and then you have uh, the other uh, non-reference isoforms uh, for instance, that may not have a phosphorylation site, so you could have uh, uh, you know, longer uh, signaling uh, at the membrane. And this is, in different tissues, exploited in a combinatorial manner. So we find different isoforms that are co-expressed in different tissues. So this is a very interesting, again, mechanism for evolution of biology to generate complexity because you can still have the same ligand that is circulating in the body, but different tissues will now respond differently because you express different combinations of isoforms. And these isoforms, like you rightly said, don't affect the structured domains. They affect the regulatory regions. Those happen to be more unstructured. And that's exactly how you could, uh, or one could exploit uh, uh, signaling in, in different contexts. Thank yeah. you. Very good. So thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Grant.